All right, I'm now being joined on the program by a professor of political economy and the founder of the Center for Values in Leadership, Professor Pat Utomi. Prof, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, let me start by asking you straight away what your take is on these uh, wranglings we've seen over the Nigerian budget. Well, um, you know, sometimes uh, learning can prove to be challenging. Uh, we, we need to bear in mind that um, this is really the first transition in Nigerian history from one government following an election to another at the federal level in Nigeria. Transitions are an art form. We have not developed that art form. And so the new kids on the block will be challenged in many ways. Uh, and this could just be one of those teaching problems uh, that come. The only thing that worries many is that it's taking uh, such a long drawn out time and that the transition program could have been planned uh, differently and could have been a little more seamless than it has been. But I think it is not unusual that something that is happening for the very first time will have the kinds of starts and stops and the kinds of difficulties. And if you bear in mind that there are going to be games within games, there are bureaucrats who are just stepping in, there are bureaucrats who are dealing with old tough issues and want to play between the new political bosses. There are politicians who are trying to get a hang of it and at the same time, you know, maybe bringing in outsiders, consultants who don't have as good a grasp. This is why many countries that are democracies and see governments move from opposition uh, to a party in power have developed templates for how transitions take place. Uh, if you take as an example, uh, a transition committee was set up by the incoming government, but it turned out not to be a transition committee at all. It turned out to be a strategy committee. Uh, 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 and for those of us who know a thing or two about transitions elsewhere in the world, it was clear that what was going on was not a transition committee. Uh, it was a strategy committee. And it's not a surprise that we have challenges of this nation. Ask you, when you look at some of the mistakes we have seen in the budget, I mean, talk about, for instance, a repetition of uh, setting provisions in the budget. We've seen, for instance, where several provisions were made for computers and people have rightly observed that it would appear what the government basically did was just to, uh, you know, just to do a photocopy of the, the, the 2015 budget. Do, do you think some very serious work went into that budget? I mean, because if some very serious work went into it, we would not be seeing uh, some of those childish mistakes, if, 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 if that will be right. Well, uh, did you have to give me the benefit of uh, the doubt I was not there. I don't know what kind of work went uh, into it. Uh, but uh, quite clearly, uh, it seems to me that, again, this kind of problem with transitions uh, is problematic when uh, you immediately get rid of a whole cream of the civil service, uh, another set gets into place, new people who took quite a while to come, come. Uh, there's there's going to be a lot of quick, rushed, cutting and pasting which is not the way it should be. Uh, I'll give you a classic example of uh, part of the problem. Uh, part of the problem was that what I heard was that the budget was going to be a zero-based budget. Now, the idea of a zero-based budget is an idea that I have been pushing personally. When I heard it was going to be a zero-based budget, I was alarmed because I knew for a you know, clear fact that it would take nearly two years to plan a zero-based budget. I mean, Jimmy Carter, in a sophisticated budget environment in the United States, struggled with a ZBB uh, in his time. Uh, so to think that we could, in three months, literally, work a zero-based budget astonished me. Uh, it, it did show that you know, there were problems with being on top of uh, that, that, that uh, ball. What, what would you say what would you say to those who have um, said part of the problem is just because if you look at the president's uh, 
well, if you like, the president's economic team, that you don't find economists in, in, in the midst of them. Do, do you think that could be part of the problem? Um, you know, <clears throat> problem can be anything. I, I don't think that the economists are, are budget people necessarily. Budgets, uh, but budgeting is an art form by public administrators. Uh, it is the philosophy of the budget that the economists work on. Um, I think that the truth of the matter is that you need a driving vision and passionately committed people to that driving vision to pull strands of a budget process as part of what enables you to accomplish that mission and therefore thoroughly work through that budget in trying to ensure that all the things there add up to achieving the goal that is set. I think what people you know, who are familiar with the process who worry about is that the people who are passionate uh, uh, and committed and, uh, and people have confidence in them uh, um, may not be quite, you know, as integrated and ingrained in processes as they should be. Maybe that's part of the reason that people wonder what's going on. But they're clever people. I think that many of the people in the team are very clever people. So I don't see that that is the problem. It, you know, I, I, I like very frequently to talk about the Brazil experience and, 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 and Cardoso. I mean, when Brazil was firing finance ministers every three months, uh, Fernando Cardoso was not the most likely person to be finance minister. But as Cardoso himself make, makes the point, when eventually the president turned to him, he was foreign minister, and he moved to finance. And what, what he did was put together the brightest young economists because of his personal credibility with the Brazilian people and his willingness to commit literally intellectual suicide, the ideas were able to be pulled together and the systems, the budgets, drove a certain new vision of Brazil that led to uh, stabilizing the economy and, and things moving forward. Let me just quickly ask you what you make of the budget itself, the size of the budget. I mean, it's been described as an, an expansionary, uh, ex expansionary <coughs> budget expansionary now. Expansionary bu budget. Um, you know, that this is the budget that could get Nigeria out of this economic lockjam we found ourselves now. Six trillion naira. What, what's your take on the budget itself? You think the size is massive enough to get this country out of uh, the economic doldrums that we face at the moment? Um, we have to be very careful here, Deji. Uh, revenues have just dropped significantly. When well, you have a significant drop in income, uh, typically, you cut your budget. Saudi Arabia's budget for uh, this year is nearly a quarter, dropped by nearly a quarter from that of last year. However, having said that, when you need stimulus in the economy, of course, you can afford a significant deficit budget to drive, to stimulate economic activity. Uh, but if you're going to have a stimulus response then it's, there's going to be a very clear strategy. What are you stimulating? How is that stimulus leading to the diversification that you are hoping for? What kind of areas are you creating new jobs? What kind of new entrepreneurship initiatives can follow a particular sets of value chains that you're trying to uh, ensure drive the new economy? I think that these are the things that should probably concern us more than just sheer size. You can have enormous size that comes to not in terms of the, its real impact in sustained growth. And you can have limited size that stimulates much more. I think that what is clear is that there is a financing gap. We need to find ways of bridging that gap. There is need to stimulate economic activity. We need to find direct ways of making sure that we stimulate activity that creates jobs. Because unemployment is the huge challenge of now. Talking about that financing gap now, the government has given uh, 
the Federal Inland Revenue Service, a, a target of 5 trillion naira. And the, internal, the FIRS has said it, it hopes to raise that amount of money and that the, a substantial part of that money, at least 80% of that, would be coming from um, non-oil revenue. So the government is looking at uh, broadening the tax base even though it says it is not introducing new taxes and all of that. Um, you, you, you think it's a target that uh, can be achieved and uh, you think it's possible to expand uh, the, tax, uh, the tax base of this country, bring uh, several people into the, tra the tax uh, dragnet now and get people to begin to pay and even get companies to begin to pay tax, especially when you consider the economic situation in the country at the moment. Well, well you see, it's a, it's a catch-22 game here. It is important, it was important yesterday, it is important today to ensure that more Nigerians begin to pay taxes for a variety of reasons, not only because government needs revenue, but because that's what connects the citizen to the state. That's what makes the citizen hold the state accountable because he directly feels it in his purse. However, the habit of not paying taxes has been so long uh, that we need to be also careful with how fast we move in trying to make people come along this tra uh, trajectory. Uh, because it's like somebody who is uh, a drug addict. Uh, you want to get him off addiction. Uh, you don't want to cut him off alcohol or drugs or whatever. If you do that the very first day, there might be some shock effect that, that can result in unintended consequences. So it's important that uh, we are measured in the way we go about uh, bringing more people into the tax net and increasing the level of taxes. Also important here, uh, we need to return to some um, essentials of supply side economics here. Uh, because, yes, they say we don't produce, we don't produce. If you don't begin to stimulate production, uh, you will never really grow. And when you begin to produce, you've got to be um, sensitive to optimum levels of taxation for, you know, a production to be able to, to rise. I mean, uh, uh, 30 or so years ago, the buzz around the world flowing out of, of course, the Reagan era was supply-side economics and the ideas of optimal tax rates and the Laffa curve, Arthur Laffa, a professor in, at the University of Southern California back in those days became particularly famous uh, with his work suggesting that beyond the certain optimal rates, uh, tax are a disincentive to uh, production and the supply challenges that come uh, from, from those. So uh, it's important to raise taxes, it's important, uh, but we need to be careful we don't get to a point where it uh, affects possibilities of even more taxes coming. Let's talk about uh, the, the issue of uh, the Naira. As we speak today, for instance, uh, at this very moment, it's exchanging and in the parallel market now, exchanging for around 380 naira to the dollar. As a matter of fact, uh, by the time people are watching this, the price might have changed. It might have gone up uh, because things hardly come down in Nigeria anyway. You look at um, the position of the government on, uh, on, on, on this uh, exchange rate now. The government has made it clear that it does not intend to devalue. Do you think... Um, this government is standing on a firm ground now and that is decision. It's actually right, economically speaking now, not to devalue and allow this wide gap now between the parallel market rate and uh, the official uh, exchange rate. Well, uh, they, they are watching in slow motion a movie that was once shown between 1983 and 1985. Um, I, I think that you cannot talk about devaluing a currency or not devaluing a currency uh, that is a market exchange rate. 
I, I don't understand the language actually. The truth of the matter is that the Naira has taken its value, unfortunately, in the way that it's been managed, the psychology of it is making things more challenged for the Naira. Um, if your purchasing power parity is like this, and you continue to say, we're well, sorry, we're not going to uh, let go of controls, you become a block currency. I thought the Naira stopped being a block currency years ago that we were some kind of managed uh, exchange uh, rate that is market determined. Uh, but if we are going back to the Naira as a block currency uh, as it was in 1982, and we say we will not devalue, we will preferentially allocate government earnings which is from oil primarily to some sectors, what you will get is very simple. Some people will get very rich, taking money from one market to another market. It doesn't matter how hard you try, that will happen. Uh, when that begins to happen, uh, you get so many imperfections, so many uncertainties that you actually worsen the challenge of stability, which is really what matters uh, for a currency. Stability is more important for me that is nominal uh, value. Uh, that instability, that uncertainty, is ultimately what makes investment challenged. And the kind of growth that you may want to see may, may not quite take place. Uh, I think that we struggle with this 84, 85, until the second tier foreign exchange market, a kind of managed market rate, moved into uh, a market rate, so to speak, and Nigeria began to regain its gait uh, uh, in, in the international uh, markets. Now that we have come so far, we are being seen as a emerging, about to emerge economy and all of that. We go straight right back to where we were in 82. Oh, I think it's going to be a sad road to travel again. Correctly, Prof. You, you are in favor of devaluation. It, will, will that be correct? I'm not in favor. I, don't, I, I think that the language itself is problematic. There's nothing like devaluing. The, the, you should go to a sort of managed floating exchange rate. Markets determine some things. You know, if you borrow some to bridge some of your financing gap and, you know, place some markets things, people see that you are doing some of the right things and there's confidence, monies will come. What has happened is that in this kind of uncertainty, the monies that we're here have left, increasing the current account deficit situation and therefore putting more pressure on the currency. So uh, it's not about devaluing or not devaluing. Uh, that's, the, that's not a market language as far as I'm concerned. That is a, a language of a managed uh, a block currency. Uh, Prof, part of what is responsible for what we are going through in this country today, economically speaking, is uh, the, the, the significant drop in the price of oil. Oil had always been the mainstay of this economy and uh, today the price of oil, nothing to write home about and it, it's really taking its toll on the Nigerian economy. If, if you were to advise us, Nigerians, how do you think we can get away from this over-dependence on oil? You know, Deji, I, I hate to sound like a broken, I don't know what, a, a scratch record. I've been saying this for how many years now. I am shocked that we are shocked that the price of oil dropped. Because it was expected, it stayed up for too long. Yet, we refuse to behave correctly when oil prices were in the stratosphere. Look, nothing happening today is new. Oil has always been a volatile commodity. In 1979-80, during the Iranian Revolution, oil prices shot into the stratosphere, quote unquote, the standards of those days, heat the magical $40 a barrel. Nobody ever thought it was possible. 
two magazines, Time and Newsweek, had the same cover story. One, one day, the world over a barrel on the price of oil. A few short months later, oil prices has, had crashed so, so low that in 1982, Nigeria did not sell a gallon of crude oil for nearly two weeks. And the volatility continued. Now, in 1998, it dropped to, in the last Abacha, earlier Abacha months, it dropped to single digits. Now, when it began to go up again, anybody who has had this kind of experience many times will know that it makes sense at a particular point in time to begin to save something so that when the rainy day comes, it will not be terrible. I personally, and I will repeat this ad nauseum, argued at the time that our upper benchmark should be $40 a barrel for budgetary purposes. And that everything over $40 a barrel up till about, say, 70 should go to a stabilization fund, which is a fund you can then draw from if oil prices were to drop to, say, 15, 20, you can therefore continue to budget at a steady $40 a barrel rate until it recovers again. And that if, any, if prices were to go beyond 70, they should go to a future fund, a sovereign wealth fund, or whatever we choose to call them these days. Uh, but you know what happened? Our political actors, the governors said, how, how can? What do you mean rainy day? It's raining torrents already. And today, they can't pay salaries. I, I think that I, I, I cannot understand why we don't have institutional memory. I don't understand how you can be beaten by the same bog several times. So I, I think we are all responsible for this. I mean, I can say that I screamed loud enough continuously. And I still remember raising this on an occasion when Professor Stiglitz, Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize uh, uh, winning economists came to Nigeria, and the finance minister at the time, Dr. Okonjewala, acknowledged, uh, you know, part, okay, yes, you're right, but they won't allow us to do more. Uh, well, I hope everybody can take their lessons and go home now. But if we had taken the appeal that I was suggesting, it wasn't even a appeal, the counsel that I had offered, steady growth would have been taking place in the Nigerian economy, we wouldn't have gotten to the levels of not too responsible wastage in government that we have today. And I think the political class needs to say to itself that there are children, there is a future to protect here. And that everything should not be for now. There is such a thing as delayed gratification. More importantly, if we had taken that strategy, we would have been able to begin to diversify the base of our economy. I have repeatedly argued that our endowments are such that we can build value chains based on certain endowments from regional perspectives where the growth of this economy will be significantly non-oil in its nature. But a certain laziness in leadership in our country, unfortunately, has, has, has left us where we are. Prof, do, do you think it is too late to begin to do something about it now? And um, you look at this government, would you say it is moving towards that uh, direction? It's never too late to begin to do anything. Uh, I, I don't have enough information to know what direction the government is moving towards, but it's never too late to begin to do something. Uh, but one thing is important. The economics has to be sensible, not emotional. And the people who are the champions of the process have to be passionate and carry the people along. Because when the people know what you're trying to do, they will move in that direction. But right now, I think there's a complete disconnect between policy and the Nigerian people. Uh, and there's just, I don't know, it's a kind of confusion. The communication is not right. Let, let me quickly ask you, Prof. You look at the Nigerian economy today. I mean, you look at the way things are. Uh, what would be your own broad assessment and, uh, of the economy, the way it is today? Well, I think that there is panic that is unnecessary. 
I think there's an obsession with exchange rates, understandably, in some instances, but uh, the panic is not... Uh, the, the, what Nigeria is going through, given its endowments, given you know, its great potential, is, is, is a blip that you know, serious managers can easily uh, uh, show the world. It's just a small passing phase and get support from friends around to ensure that that phase is passed fairly quickly and momentum gained for where Nigeria should be going. I don't think it should be something that should generate the kinds of panic and excitement I see around. Professor Otomi, I know you are a member of the APC. Do you think the APC government can get Nigeria up and running? Because it would appear Nigeria is down at the moment. Uh, the APC government had a transition, what was called a transition committee, which was really a strategy committee, which I think did a tremendous amount of work to set direction. I'm sure it's possible to find the documents that that committee put together and work with it. <laughs> well, Professor Pater Tommy, thank you very much for uh, your time and thank you very much for joining us on the program. Well, we'll take a short break and when we come back, we'll continue this discussion. Every day, every hour, and every minute, news break in Nigeria. Things happen so fast, it's most times difficult to track and comprehend them. But that's what we do right here on DJ360. 2015, would you want to come back again? It's like asking Jesus Christ if he knew he was going to die, will you, come, will you want to come back as the savior of the world again? We do not just help you track the stories, we break them down. Explore all the angles, analyze the issues so that you can fully comprehend the stories and use them to make the right decisions. All right, welcome back. Just before we go, Nobel laureate Professor Walesh Inka has also been speaking on the state of the Nigerian economy. Here's what he's been saying. My attitude is that uh, I belong to a people who are very impatient of results. I have a very clear idea of governance tempo. And if the government at least does one thing which is critical, which is crucial, without, of course, breaking the law, uh, without uh, sort of ignoring the Constitution, if that goal is attained by constitutional means, if nothing else, we, were, we would have moved in this nation at least 10 years ahead. And all I can say right now is that there is a very definite dedication both to that target and also the tempo of motion is for me very reasonable. In fact, I would say more than reasonable. It's us now, on the human rights side, we have to watch very carefully to see that that goal is achieved without forfeiting the fundamental human right, which form the basis of free citizenship. So if anything at all, I would say that the human rights uh, will carry on their own responsibilities while governance moves in the direction which I believe most Nigerians absolutely approve. And I'm speaking, of course, of corruption. Just getting money back, punishing those who are responsible for the impoverishment of the nation, of the people, ensuring that such processes take a certain form that others who are in trusted position will hesitate before they rob the nation with contempt this has been a case of exposure of in-your-face robbery, in-your-face, and damn the consequences. And while I will not ask the government, the government to damn the consequences of their motion, I hope that they remain within that zone of what I call ethical rigor. Uh, the economic condition of a nation, of a people, does not deteriorate overnight. Something came before that deterioration a certain prolonged and unchecked process of attrition which was neglected in the past is now knocking on the door. 
the consequences of possibly misgovernance, in other words, is what we are undergoing right now. So don't look to see a bonanza economy for me in the, in the next uh, few months to a year. The recovery is going to take quite a while. But at the same time, we must rely on our objective economic experts to tell the government when it is going wrong, when it's taking certain measures which might just compound the problem you know, and in the end make the people the ultimate victims. So yes, I agree with uh, those who say the economy is bad. I think it's obvious. Uh, and uh, in fact, it's so bad in my view that I think that uh, the president should call an emergency economic conference in which experts will be invited, uh, consumers, producers, uh, labor unions, um, university uh, pr uh, experts, professors, etc., etc. I think we really need an emergency economic conference, a rescue operation bringing as many heads together and then plotting the way forward. Well, let's see what the government does with that call by the Nobel laureate for an emergency economic conference. That's it on the program. If you want to watch it again, it's simple. Just go to our website, tv360nigeria.com. You'll find the program and lots more there. You can also watch us on uh, YouTube by subscribing to our YouTube channel. That's uh, youtube.com forward slash TV360 Nigeria. Do subscribe to get uh, latest videos and updates. And you can follow us on Google Plus at TV360 Nigeria. Just like us on Facebook. The address is facebook.com forward slash TV360 online. You can also follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at TV360 online. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next week.